Okay, I think I think that's brilliant. We're just going to backtrack a little bit and actually like do the preamble and be like, "Hi, everyone." <laughs> <laughs> no, people will be like, "Who is that person? Who's that that girl? Who's that girl?" Like, you know, video bombing Mr. Sullers. Okay, brilliant. So, uh, why don't you start? <laughs> <laughs> so, one on my list was <laughs> finding different interpretations. So, whatever exam board students do they get most credit from looking at different ways we can interpret characters or themes. That's basically it. And if you've got competing or opposite interpretations, it's much easier for you to write well because you're constantly aware of what you're trying to prove or disprove. And it's really easy to include both views in parts of your answer and whenever you do that, a light bulb goes off in the examiner's heads and they think, right, this is a conceptualized response. This is a student who really knows their stuff. So I'm definitely wanting to give this a good mark. And the other reason having alternative interpretations works is whenever you meet a new quotation or a new idea, you're linking it back to these competing interpretations. So I think you actually remember the text much better and you get much more personally involved in it. It makes literature come alive. There's a point to it. So that was my top number one tip. Yeah, I agree with Mr. Sullers in terms of uh, coming up with competing interpretations. I think that is always the best way to show depth in your answer. Um, I personally think a lot of students just kind of latch onto one interpretation that they personally find genuinely very good. But then what they do is then they'll just kind of parrot it which really compromises the depth of the answer. So my second tip is start with why. So I think um, a lot of students tend to just kind of get flustered when they first start just thinking, okay, how do I come up with analysis? How do I come up with interpretation in the first place, right? So I think a lot of students tend to get sidetracked by the how. So they um, definitely think about, oh, how does the author show this or that about a certain theme or character? Uh, and the how is often a question about technique, I feel. But I, actually, the how is just a means to asking a bigger and more important question, which is the why, right? So it's always important that we think about why does the author choose to use a specific technique, right? Um, especially in poetry, for example. Why does the author have the character do or say something at a specific point in the text? Um, or why does the scene or the chapter begin and end like that? For example, if you think about, oh, why does the uh, chapter end like this? we can then think oh it's a cliffhanger right so these terms should then come as a result of you engaging with the why question okay so bottom line is never ever simply identify a key technique or just regurgitate a bunch of quotes and think that's you know kind of job done it's really important to link the techniques or the quotes to the author's purpose or the wider message or theme conveyed i think yeah i love that so when you're getting students to understand the why how much do you use like the social and historical context and how much the context of the author's life? So context is, I think, a really interesting question. I think context should always just inform, but it should never really usurp, you know, like the main analysis. So I think the why in terms of context would always come at the start and the intro. But when we're thinking about the why in terms of why a certain technique is used, that wouldn't necessarily link so much to the context, I think. So yeah. there's macro why and there's the micro why. Yeah, the macro why would be more the context. Why did Shakespeare, like, you know, feature witches, for example? Oh, okay, because of, you know, James, blah, blah, blah. You know, he, he was interested in half and half you. That's macro why, right? You wouldn't really feature that in every single main body paragraph, I don't think. What are your views on context, actually? For me, context is so important because it's the only really real way you can understand why the author is constructing the text in a particular way. Right. You know, or why are they presenting this character in this way? Mm. It always comes back to some sort of contextual reasons. Mm. Um, so for me, having an understanding of the context makes it much easier to understand as what you call the macro why, the big why. In the last few months, I've tried to think of, like, how would I join all of literature together for a student? I've just thought, yeah, there's only really five whys that any author is writing about. It's either morality linked to religion or gender power relationships in society, yeah. um, the impact of science and technology or the impact of 
education, and then people's different social statuses. And so I reckon if I studied any text, I would be able to write about it just thinking about those five whys. It would also transfer to any text I had to analyze in the language exam as well. When I first started teaching, I did what most teachers do. I taught the text really well, or I hoped it was really well. And then I focused on key quotations, usually too many. And then when students had really brilliant knowledge of the text, I then said, write an essay. Uh, I might help you plan it, uh, but he, you know, go away and write an essay. I've realized that is like the most inefficient way to learn a text because it takes forever. And the kids never actually learn, how do I write a top grade essay? Whereas I'm now thinking, right, if I had my time again, I'd go in with a text like Macbeth or Christmas Carol, and I'd say, right, these are the 10 essays we're going to study. And these 10 essays would cover every character and every theme, and they'd cover all sorts of alternative interpretations. And I think that's important because then you'd put two alternative interpretations in front of students and they wouldn't just be able to nick one. They'd have to argue and they'd synthesize and make their own meaning. As a student, you can do that for yourself. I can go on the exam board website and I know what the top seven questions are going to be. And then you just write your essays to those seven questions as your revision. My theory is that when you go into the exam, you've kind of already got the answer in your head, even if the question is something you've never written. Every part of that answer you've already thought through in one of, or two or three or four of your other essays. And if you think an essay under time conditions might take you 45 minutes, well, you could spend two hours writing it with your books in front of you. And so that would be, you know, 10 essays, 20 hours of revision, guaranteed top grade, and you're done. Write the essays and you'll stroll the exam. Yeah, I actually really agree with that because that was my next tip, to be honest. Um, so, for example, by, by the way, guys, like, you know, Mr. Salas and me, we came up with our own set of tips. So, you know, we didn't know what we were going to yeah. come up with. But this was one of, yeah, this was actually the overlapping one. And I, because I really agree with that, I think. Um, but I think it's slightly different, right? I think um, it probably would be helpful, obviously, to write, to actually write the essay, prepare for the actual essay and write it up. But I think it's equally helpful to just draft up essay plans. So you can revise by drafting up essay plans, right? Because my point is, I think students just need to stop passively absorbing material. Yeah. Just kind of like sit there and be like, I've done my revision for like five hours. I've memorized quotes. Why am I still not doing well? Well, because that's not the way to revise effectively. I think it's most effective when you're actively engaging with your material. So I think what you could do, guys, is when you're drafting up an essay plan, you can kind of go through your list of key themes or imagine each theme or topic as an uh, exam essay question. So one way that I think would be uh, effective is if you look at past paper questions and then just kind of use that, like use the way they word it use the way they phrase it and just kind of slot in like different themes and like write an essay based on those command command words and those questions right and so obviously this you know when it comes to an essay plan really clear tables with um columns and rows bullet points clear sections what quotes to use etc and so even better if you guys can do this within a time limit when you're revising i know this is added pressure but I really think it's effective when you just say, okay, I'm just going to set myself like 10 to 15 minutes just writing up the essay plan, really, being really disciplined. And I think if you do that enough, it's not necessarily that you will actually be able to prep for the actual essay when you know it comes time for the exam. It's just that you will have honed your essay planning skills for the actual exam. So it's those skills that you would uh, improve. And that's super crucial to doing well. Because I noticed in, I think, the 2018 June AQA examiner's report where they literally say, you know, a lack of planning is limiting some students who could progress through the mark scheme if they developed a clear and sustained interpretation of the text. So I think that obviously is something that's super important. Yeah, I'm sorry, I was just, my wife's just wandered in. Hi! <laughs> <laughs> Hello! Uh, you don't need to do that now, do you? Okay, no. I love that approach. So I was really interested to see what you'd say about planning because you've obviously got a really structured and organized way of making a plan. So what would that look like? Well, the idea is actually to just kind of create a table with say maybe three columns and then you'd have 
your intro main body section and the conclusion and then it'll be bullet points saying like what you need to include in each section right so in the intro obviously you need some context and you need the thesis statement yeah. right like these are non-negotiables you just have to include them and then for a main body section for a main body paragraph you just need like you need your evidence your quote and then that leads on to the analysis i've realized that you know for some for some students especially maybe when you get to an a level this might be a slightly more stilted approach but i think yeah. it's the awareness of it because these things you have to include in an essay anyway right and so maybe say if you get to a high level then you can kind of write okay, what about framing this in a, in a different interpretative framework? And then just writing down that framework in the table. As It's just basically being able to visualize what you're going to write as opposed to just being like, okay, you know, I'm going to put pen to paper and just start writing. Yeah. All in my head. No, it's not. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it is, it's just in a jumble. So I think it's, it's about just being able to visualize that flow, even if it's just a rough sketch. That's kind of the rationale. Yeah. You don't have to necessarily follow it, like, you know, to the T. I mean, I think that's important. I'd love to see that video. I think that will be great. Yeah. Um, like actually planning an essay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think there are a lot of teachers who don't even teach the thesis statement. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I could be wrong. We might get loads of comments saying, oh, you're talking rubbish. But no, I... No, no. I, I, why do you say that, actually? So the dominant form of teaching, I think, students get in school, it'll be interesting to see what viewers think, is they do lots of activities like quote exploders, where they get, like, a quotation, and then they write, you know, six or seven different things about that quotation and go into it at massive depth. Well, it'd be interesting to see what you you feel. When I write exam essay answers myself, I kind of never go overboard in the quotation. I'm much more interested in linking different parts of the text together, different mm -hmm. quotations, different choices that the writer has made about structure and form. And I never like zoom in for, you know, 150 words on a particular quotation. But in class, that's what teachers do. They put a quotation up and then they annotate the hell out of it. Yeah. Uh, and then they expect that to be useful when a kid's writing an essay. Well, in those terms, it's not useful because they would never take all that analysis and stick it in an essay because your, your essay wouldn't go anywhere. Right. Uh, but, but that's what I think teachers do. Um, they don't actually sit down and say, right, I'm teaching this text and I'm going to answer this question. I'm going to write my answer so that it's between six and 900 words long and give it to my students. By and large, teachers don't do that. And so they don't actually know how to write GCSE or A-level essays because they don't do it. Um, and, and when I work with heads of department, I'll often sit down with them and say, right, well, write that essay. And, you know, they'll, they'll write a 1,500-word essay. <laughs> Okay, well, you've got 45 minutes in the exam. What are you going to do now? Right. Oh, no. Uh, what? <laughs> oh, I haven't thought about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, I don't know why, though. Like, maybe it's because they don't want students to just feel like, oh, you can just write an essay and then memorise it. I, yeah, I think that does, does come into it. I think that what teachers do is they take the overall skill of being able to write a really coherent essay and they break it down into all its component parts. And then they obsess about the parts, like how do we analyze a quotation? How do we write about context and weave that in without it being a paragraph on its own? Mm -hmm. And what they don't do is say, right, well, if I put all those parts together, what have I now got? Have I got a 700 word essay that everyone in my class could write? Mm -hmm. Or have I got a 2000 word essay that no one in my class could write in 45 yeah. minutes? You know, if there are teachers watching this, they'll say, no, I, I don't do that but do they actually sit down and write essays under exam conditions so they know what their kids are up against? I think for the most part, the answer is probably not. Mm. Yeah, and so that's why I think genuinely that like students, they, they should, in order to put themselves in the best position, is to actually use whatever knowledge that they've learned from quote exploding um, activities in class, um, or whatever they, like knowledge that they learn, and then consolidate that into a coherent argument, right? Because ultimately it's about how you present your knowledge. It's not about the fact that you've got all the knowledge in your head. That's great, but yeah. who knows like, what you know, right? Unless you present it well. So remember that, everyone. You know, what I love about this is 
my comments are like my videos they just go on <laughs> and your comments are like no i've thought about this boom 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 <laughs> that's gonna be that's brilliant good. no that's good yeah. right because as as long as you know people can get value out of it i think that's just, you know the most important thing i guess it's yeah. just a different way of approaching things like are you but you you seem like a plan you seem like a very like planned and organized person but that's what i love about your channel is that it does deliver so much in in short chunks it's just going to be brilliant way for students to revise uh, hopefully anyway <laughs> tip five by mr sellers if you think if we go back to the big whys why has the author written this the most important reasons are nearly always revealed by the way they end the text so endings are super important and an author will never end the text in a way that doesn't fit the whole so in the author's mind everything in the end wraps up everything that they've been writing about. And so you will be able to interpret most about the ending. And the other thing it will do is it tells you which quotations to learn because you'll know, you know, two or three quotations from the ending that will be relevant to near enough every essay you ever come across. And that's kind of money in the bank in two ways. I know which quotations I'm going to be able to use, but I also know how I'm going to link that to the author's point of view. So I've already hit the top grades before I walk into the exam, because I know whatever the examiner asks me, these quotations and ideas will be relevant. Yeah, I actually think that's super interesting. I never really thought about this point. Yeah, and, and so when you think about it, right, when it comes to, say, plays, catharsis is super important and it comes at the end. Right? Yeah. Um, or when you think about, say, a Shakespearean sonnet, the rhyming couplet is super important and it comes at the end. You need to actually engage with the text structure as a whole. And you can't do that yeah. without also caring about the ending and specifically how it echoes perhaps certain things that, that showed up, you know, at the start of at the start of a play or at the start of the poem or, or novel. Yeah. There's some sort of like echoing going on. I, I love the way that you went in at the the kind of macro level of structure. So we'll have catharsis at the end, we'll have a rhyming couplet at the end. Um, and of course, that's the other way that students can get top grades is understanding how the structure can link to the meaning, which is what so many of your videos do. They just get into the top grades really quickly. Yes, absolutely. Engaging with structure is something that Mr. Salas talk about, talks about all the time. And, and actually also something that I think is super important, which is also going to be my final tip. 